Well, 2021 was a headline year for startups looking to go public and take their ambitions to the next level. It was a journey where nine brands ranging from food to fashion came of age with IPOs, collectively raising over $6 billion from the market. Now, broadly, the startup ecosystem has raised over thrice the figure of equity investments in just a single year between 2021 and 2020. Now, in a winter of discontent caused by the pandemic, it seems to be raining money for startups. No wonder then that over two dozen brands are waiting in line to get listed this year. From a year that defied all odds, we are now looking forward to a year of breakthroughs when it comes to India becoming a true startup nation if these IPOs come on stream. But if you look at the fine print, there's still a lot of heavy lifting to be done for these companies to effectively manage their tax and GST compliances and structure them in a way that takes care of the challenges of today and tomorrow and leaves the bandwidth free for leadership to focus on exponential growth. On our panel today, titled Startups Negotiating GST and Tax Compliances in the Midst of an IPO Boom, we will understand the nuances at play when it comes to issues and the solutions that could play an effective role in creating that space for growth. I'm your host, Gautam Srinivasan, and joining me on this episode of Mint's Navigating Compliance with Technology series presented by Clear are a galaxy of finance and operations leaders. Let me quickly introduce them to you, starting with Lavanya Pachisia, COO at leading online innerwear retailer Zivame, Priyanka Seth Vadhera, CFO, Indifi Technologies Private Limited, which is a leading online lending platform that provides online business loans to small businesses. Abhishek Gupta, CFO at OYO, which has become a digital platform enabler to entrepreneurs and small businesses with hotels and homes around the world. Rohit Pansari, CFO at Industry Buying, which is India's largest online marketplace for industrial goods, business supplies and more. And Rohit Razdan, Chief Business Officer at Clear. Quite a galaxy of leaders that we have with us. So I'm looking forward to very interesting viewpoints coming in. Thank you everyone for joining. And before we begin, here's a message to our audience to fill out a survey online and submit it to us at the end of this discussion. All right, uh, let's begin. Uh, I'll come to you, Lavanya, first. What do you think is driving the current startup IPO boom? And in your opinion, what does it mean for the broader Indian startup ecosystem? Because expectations are high considering the volume of money coming in. Um, see, um, Gautam, actually, uh, it, it's something that uh, startups have started going to IPO uh, route. You know, this is not this is not a route which was never known, but it is just that you are seeing a lot of it coming together. Uh, I think so. A couple of things which are just playing that factor. One is government has become very very proactive and is actually promoting startup as a as a policy. You know, they are talking about ease of doing business. They are very uh, committed to kind of increase our indexes across the world. Also globally, um, today, the kind of problem solving and startups, what they are doing is not only recognized in India, but it is also something which we are able to kind of give us a global solution. So uh, this obviously kind of creates a very nice ecosystem for people to kind of scale and grow, okay? Uh, so with scale and growth, it also depends on what we are creating, like if you're creating IPs or things which, 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 can, which are adopted globally, you are problem solving and are able to think, you know, kind of solve the same problems which are globally, the acceptance of those companies are high. So while earlier people were just talking about listing only in India, today people are going and listing even in NASDAQ, right? Earlier, like a long couple of decades back, it was only the large conglomerates which were talking about listing on NASDAQ, but now, you know, even the things are there. So, so I feel it's just the whole ecosystem and the confidence that and the talent what we have, which we'll be able to deliver is actually, you know, driving this talent back to India, you know? Also, last but not the least, I think so IPO gives the exit both to the promoters and to the investors. And that is something which we can't definitely ignore, right? <laughs> so it's, it's a known route. Uh, so that's why you see the acceptance of going IPO much, much more out here today. 
Absolutely. We are indeed going up the value curve, as you mentioned. The more IPs you have, the more uh, sort of a moat that you build around your business in terms of value. The others, the investors, they, they see the value of that. And global investors especially are very interested in the Indian growth story. But as an extension of that, here's a question to Priyanka, which a lot of people wonder. You know, we see a lot of companies, let's say a Zomato, which are loss making even as revenue surge and they still go public with much fanfare. So how do you explain this? Well, uh, there is nothing which really stops a loss making company from going public. You know, SEBI itself has uh, a different uh, set of rules for loss making companies to going public, you know, like kept tapping the retail investors to 10 percent from the normal uh, 35 persons. And hence, you see companies like Zomato, Paytm, uh, Deliveri, Mobiquake, etc., who have or will be taking this route uh, very soon. We need to understand why these companies are really loss making. You know, they are. They may have a high investment in technology. They may have high uh, employee acquisition costs because you're picking up the best talent from the market. You may have high marketing costs till the time your brand picks up and start generating revenue itself, etc. So while these companies may be negative, but they they generally have a unit uh, positivity. They have a unit economics uh, which is working for them, and they do command high valuations in spite of the cash burn. So we need to understand the benefits that these companies have. They have a disruptive, uh, you know. Uh, technology. They have uh, access to huge customer database, which is uh, these days the new gold. Uh, they may have innovative tech-led uh, solutions for the common issues that we that we see or we face. Uh, they may have the ability to grow uh, exponentially in digital uh, setups. They may be able to tap differentiated uh, customer base or a newer market, etc. So these kind of uh, you know benefits or the differentiated factors that they have that would outlook would outweigh the current uh, profitability issues with these uh, companies. And since they have a new, new business model, uh, they will be loss making till the time they achieve that uh, critical uh, mass. So while the financials are important, but investors, they do assess the future roadmap and the unit economics and the scalability of these companies. Further, IPO will give benefit, you know, it, it, is, a, it is a benefiting uh, route for both the company and the retail investor. For the retail investor, the returns are much more than the FD or the small saving schemes that we generally see. Uh, digital and fintech are the new buzzword in the market and the retail investors, they get to participate in this uh, new wave and uh, be part of that promising story of the companies. Some of them also invest for FOMO, but largely they want to be a part of what is what is happening uh, in the market. As for the companies, as Lavanya said, it gives an exit route to the uh, P investors, to the promoters. Um, IPO route or the uh, you know uh, markets are, uh, are 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 a base of huge funding and uh, liquidity access as well as uh, it also brings uh, visibility and credibility to these companies once they list on the on the browsers. All right, it's a it's a case of looking beyond the balance sheet, especially for retail investors as they battle two ends of the spectrum: the ecstasy of their of their of the share prices going up from listing price, or if they see the prices coming down from where it was listed. But uh, from that broad trend of what's going on, let's look at the specifics uh, of the regulatory ecosystem, which is playing its role in in developing India as a startup nation. Abhishek. How would you assess India's current startup regulatory ecosystem and is it conducive to sustained growth? You know, compliance is one space where, say, the government is adopting technology at a much faster pace as opposed to the rest of the ecosystem. This has been brought out repeatedly during my earlier discussions on the series. And it has also brought about three trends as that happens. Supply chain is getting merged with compliance, which necessitates the ecosystem to be compliant. The amount of buffers given by the government is coming down. So things are becoming a bit more stringent, e-invoicing and GST is coming together thanks to tech and say consideration is being given to even connect direct and indirect tax. So broadly, where do things stand and where do we go from here? First of all, Gautam, thank you for uh, having me on the show uh, and uh, happy to represent OYO uh, on this platform. Look, I think uh, uh, the, the environment, uh, macro environment from a regulatory and tax standpoint is, uh, is highly conducive, becoming more and more uh, conducive to for the startups to develop, uh, grow, and ultimately uh, become public. The investors really want continuity of policy, right? And they need uh, predictability of policy. So, uh, uh, and uh, the recent measures taken, whether it is on the retrospective tax uh, measures, uh, that that ensure that there is continuity in policy or uh, from the regulators on the 
on the SEBI side, uh, which uh, Priyanka mentioned, where uh, pre-profit companies can also test the markets. Um, but uh, if you uh, know today, right, if you look at the composite indices, uh, whether it is the, uh, the 50 share Nifty index or larger indexes, the tech uh, platform or tech composition in those indices are really right now very small as you compare it with uh, uh, MSCI or a global S&P 500 or any other global indices. So which means that there's a huge opportunity uh, that, uh, that is there for uh, the tech startups to emerge and become stronger uh, and get their due space in, a, in the public market. Um, from one year ago when they were only probably like five listed stocks in the consumer tech ecosystem. So this continuity of policy, ease of doing business and a macro shift from offline to online, from unorganized to organized that the government is championing. Now, all of that is uh, highly conducive and favorable uh, for, the, for the overall environment. All right, while continuity of policy and ease of business is the focus, there are still some anomalies, which I want to get uh, the viewpoint on this panel from. Rohit Pansari, I'll come to you, you know, as a marketplace. Is it time now to say, correct some of the anomalies of the GSM, of the GST Act, especially say for MSMEs who are say merchants in your marketplace. For example, it allows traders doing business for less than one and a half crore annual revenue to register for a composition GST scheme. Now that scheme significantly simplifies compliance for traders and allows them to pay tax at a fixed rate of 1%. But when the traders under the scheme, they move to sell on an online marketplace, they move to a normal scheme and they pay full rate on all transactions. Now, this seems to be amounting to disincentivization. So is there a case now for better tax policies to come in now that we've seen some stability as, you know, we have seen tax buoyancy improve, tax collections improve on the GST route? Thank you, Gautam, for having me here. So uh, as we see, uh, as uh, Abhishek also said, uh, with uh, e-invoicing, uh, uh, with uh, further new GST compliances related to input tax credit, everything coming into place, the government of India is becoming more and more stricter as compared for the compliance perspective that there should be no leakage in the whole supply chain ecosystem, the no fraud, et cetera. So here I feel, yes, it is uh, really important for uh, for the companies, for the organization to focus on the tax compliances. It's not only, it's not only from a perspective uh, like an interest or a default or a penalty, as you mentioned. It is not only from that perspective, but now how the taxation part is coming into place from a working capital perspective, it is very important with the GST input, say for the small traders as well who are paying TCS. For them also the GST input credit, if you don't able to utilize it, and you don't have the right checks and balances, then you will lose on cash front. So, so it is it is becoming more and more important from the organization from a working capital perspective as well. And as a, as as a marketplace, we have been observing uh, in any any of the uh, strategic buyouts or any of the foreign investors who are looking to invest into your company, uh, be it TCS or a trader compliance or or uh, your own TDS compliances. Uh, any offshore uh, outside India company is very much keen to in invest into a company who is tax compliant mm -hmm. from both TCS as well as GST and TDS. So having said that, yes, it is becoming cumbersome for organization, growing organizations like us, where uh, there is too many compliances, too many uh, hiccups. Uh, every day the law is changing. There are hiccups. But yes, with digitization, and with uh, proper AI tools and say Power BI, uh, Power BI smart reports, uh, eliminating all Excel tools and everything, we can have a robust mechanism to take care of these compliances, especially with mm. uh, outsourced players like uh, ClearTax, where you can have your GST returns filed at a tap of a button. And uh, for a leadership and the CFO and the management, you have the right dashboards where you can have all the compliances, regulations, all the key alerts coming to your view so so that is what uh, that is what is helping us that is how, how we are able to cope up with this uh, latest uh, everyday change in the tax structure which is coming so yes it is complex but uh, with digitization this process is becoming really efficient for the new age startups today 
Absolutely. And that's where the role for players like Clear also comes yeah, in, where they yeah. make that process easier. And of course, some of the guests have mentioned, you know, TCS, TDS, GST, when are we going into a sort of a single tax regime? But, uh, well, we can dream, can't we? Right. But on another side of that equation, Rohit, India is also seeking to bring e-commerce under the ambit of its new data privacy and protection law. So, Rohit Mansari, what impact do you think that will have on the startup landscape in India? So, uh let me talk about what the pdp policy is it's it's india has been following the it act 2000 till now and uh, companies and the countries outside uh, outside countries are uh, strengthening their data privacy and protection policy in late today so india is also trying to do that though the policy has not been uh, regulated till now it is in the draft stage but what it talks about is uh, what data you take from a consumer how you take the data from a consumer how you protect the data from any any leakage any 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 kind of leakage or any kind of breach so any data to be taken whether be it a personal data or a non personal data of a consumer has to be taken with proper consent from the consumer things like earlier there was no concept of uh, having a data security officer in the company but uh, with this policy coming into if it comes into place then these regulations are there that you need to have a data security officer in the company, localization of the personal data. The personal data can't be uh, stored outside outside India. So these are the things which has come into place. All in all, how it impact the startup ecosystem. So it is just not only the data protection thing, but it is a it gives more coverage to data sharing as well. Hmm. With the access to the non-personal data of the consumers with the proper consent, wherein there was no regulation earlier, with that coming into picture, now you have access to all the non-personal data of the consumer, where you can give more personalized services to the consumer, you can give services to the consumer, which is of more need to the person, more relevant, and it is it, it in turn would uh, help the businesses to retain the customers, to in, improve their cohorts, to improve the retention, retention of the customers, as you can give more relevant services to the customer basis, the non uh, non-personal data which you get from the consumers. So yes, I think it would be tedious for the companies growing stage startups to have this whole ecosystem built, the technology and the infrastructure built in. But if you are prepared in advance in the long term, it would help somehow to have more consumer patterns, more behaviors, but would help the businesses to scale. All right. Well, simplifying compliance, that's what everyone is looking yeah. from, from every aspect, whether it's internal organization or external customers. We've been talking about challenges. Let's also look at some solutions. Rohit Razdan, I'll bring you in. 2021, as I mentioned, was a year of unicorns for India and several companies made their big IPO debuts as, you know, companies grow, ensuring compliances can be a tedious task for startup firms, especially that seldom say have fully structured finance functions. So tell us how solutions from say clear can help ease the burden of financial compliance yeah <clears throat> hi Kautam. uh thank you everybody uh, for being here for taking me on this uh, uh, panel as well so I'll, I'll just add a few few thoughts um, and it was interesting to hear you know everybody speak about see fundamentally uh, as as companies go public right what's fundamentally what's happening is people are considering these companies to be grown-ups right uh there was there was a like uh, some of us remember that whole uh, 2010 to 2015, 2016 kind of a phase where all of these companies were considered to be labs, right? Something was happening there and you're taking, a, you know, a foreign guy's money and you're playing with it somehow. Uh, that's okay, right? I think what is happening now is there is an acknowledgement that there is a teenage of, of uh, or somewhere between a teenage and adulthood, right? That's happening to the overall startup sector. So, <clears throat> so more and more rules that apply always to the rest of the world are now going to be applied to the, to this world as well maybe gently maybe over a period of time but that's what i think these companies are now mentally they have to start to think like right so so all the uh, you know kind of move fast and, and break things mentality to kind of move fast and, and try at least not to break things right that mentality has to come in and and that's where i think compliance starts to play a role now for, for good or for bad right the growth of uh, the growth of the the startups is is happening when the uh, you know, when, when the government has also said that they are tightening overall rules for the whole industry, right? And and B2B, uh, you know, taxes in India, uh, and, and I'll just take a slightly broader uh, view as well, right? If you see fundamentally, you know, as a, as a growing economy, right? All of us are in some shape or form, right? All the startups that we have, 
are fundamentally built on a, a country that has to grow, right? I mean, otherwise there's not enough revenue, purchasing power, nothing, right? So, so that fundamental level growth has to be driven by the government at some level, right? Uh, all of us can, like all of us are like, you know, the fifth layer on top, right? Like the basic level of, you know, the roads, power, internet, all of these things, right? We, like Mr. Ambani can only do so much, right? the government has to also do a lot, right? So for that, taxes have to grow and governments have realized that they have to invest more. In personal taxes, as all of us know, there's not much to go, right? Like the personal taxes are, are tapped out at every single level. You increase any more and you will have like, you know, I would say a huge, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, commotion in the country, right? Everybody, in fact, for every uh, budget, they, they keep saying, you know, lower tax here, lower tax here, right? Uh, so, so therefore, the B2B taxation side is a huge strategic initiative for the government and they're not going to let it go, whether it is Modi government, whether it is uh, second government, third government, it's not going to go anywhere, right? Now, with that, in the context of startups, right, there's, there's three things that companies like us, at least, who, who consider themselves to be the back-end companies, right? We are fundamentally a back-end company uh, to all the front-end companies that are here and, and outside this room, right? Now, uh, what we see is uh, for whether companies going IPO or they, are, they have exits in any shape or form, right? The, for the front-end business to scale, right? Uh, when, when the front-end starts to scale, then, then it requires a lot of support from any CFO's office, right? Like any sales team that is scaling, any, any front-end that's scaling requires support from legal, finance, and so on and so forth, right? At that point of time, if you have a shaky back-end, right? It's a huge problem because then a CFO is always thinking, you know, do I focus on all this commotion that is coming from me new from the field or do I fix things which I know are broken in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the kitchen, right? So that's the commotion that they go through. And uh, in case of startups, uh, you know, that starts to become even more complicated uh, when they think about from a compliance standpoint, because the compliance regime itself is changing, right? So how much ever I would say solid a CFO is, right? There's only so much that they can, you know, kind of look forward in terms of compliances, in terms of technology, you know, literally some of the tools that even we make and our business is compliance, right? Like we don't know six months earlier what we are going to be making six months later, right? But we have to read the tea leaves and we do that tea leaf reading for, for the CFOs, right? And we take a point of view that this is where we think the, the market is going to evolve and these are the tools that you're going to need, right? So I think now adopting those tools, you know, requires a certain mindset. Uh, there are a lot of companies which are still in the mindset that we will do everything ourselves, which is which is great, right, if you can. Uh, but I think the reality, uh, as, as we are realizing, is that there's so much to be done in each of these growth-oriented companies that that to in, to adopt tools, right, which are a kind of modern age, right, which means like they can scale with your systems, they are API-fied, you know, that they are changing, you know, all of those things, right, and and come with support and so on. I think it starts to become pretty much a no-brainer, uh, especially when when you you require a mix of a domain and, and function, right? Like you you need like both taxation and finance and legal understanding, and then you need functional kind of product technology, all of that level understanding as well, right? So I think that's that's one. Um, the second thing, as as you, uh, I think Rohit pointed out, is is working capital, right? See, so far, or at least like two, three years back, compliance used to be an area which used to bother a few, I would say, God-fearing people in the company, right? For the rest of the people, it was like, let's make revenues, let's make profits, right? You know, compliance, dekha jayega, right? I mean, no jayega, I mean, we'll manage. Once it comes, we'll manage, right? Uh, right, and manage had multiple connotations depending on how clean of a company you are doing business in, right? I think now, as as the government has become much more uh, artificial intelligence oriented, right, technology oriented, and we see this every day because, like, we can tell from our kind of customer base, uh, you know, very large companies are now starting to get audits, right? Um, and and government is catching their data like in in very very smart ways, right? They can see the disconnect because a lot of these systems are more connected than you and I think, right? Because we are interacting with multiple agencies, government is connecting dots from behind, right? And right now they are starting to uh, slap the uh, the extremely big boys uh, on, on very flagrant, uh, let's say, uh, things that should not be missed, right? But it will not stay to extremely big boys and it will not stay to extremely flagrant, right? Mm -hmm. Both of those things are going to expand. So now that explains yeah. the tax collections going up, Rohit. Is that why we've seen one lakh thirty-five thousand crore of uh, GST collections being lost? Because now the hammer is coming down. Actually, I would not even say the hammer has come down, right? I would say this is a hammer being put somewhere in that room, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, the hammer, the hammer As an indication. 
yeah when hammer starts to come down i genuinely believe it will become 2x it will go from to like 3 lakh crores uh, right i think what has happened is last one year of electronic invoicing has closed down many many loops and lot of people who are even like the last of i would say cowboys are now falling right last of cowboys are saying ki now phas jayenge right so i think that is happening but the other thing that i was pointing to was working capital right mm-hmm. now the government is saying very they have they have created a system where they are saying one of the two things will happen either we will have compliance in the country right or we will get higher collections right if you don't want to be compliant your input you know input tax credits will get screwed right if that gets screwed you will pay me more taxes right which you should have been good enough to like collect for yourself but otherwise you are doing charity for the country leaving more money on the table that's great right so either which way government doesn't care now they have created a system where they will be beneficiaries of either a compliant regime or a regime that is not compliant but paying them money unnecessarily right so i think i think both of these things right i think from a a company that's going public right are are extremely important right because mm-hmm. because you you need to have a back end that is solid and and a cfo that can be a participant in the growth and you need to have working capital i mean uh, you alluded to um, you know again um, you know you and priyanka and others alluded to the profitability and so on right now like 3% 5% of you know of of profits getting stuck in working capital uh, will get questioned right at some point of time right the, the market won't stay where you know like that doesn't matter right there was a time when when pnl didn't matter now you know now pnls will matter and, and then again i think these compliances will become more important all right these compliance interactions are reminding me more of an episode of office office where the person used to say do baatein ho jayengi so at least the option is given saying you either be compliant or be ready to face the consequences i also saw priyanka smiling when you spoke about the role of a cfo so i'm going to ask the next next question both from the perspective of a cfo and a coo so i'll ask this question to both priyanka and lavanya starting with priyanka we spoken about you know more focused on growth they startups are finding it challenging to prioritize tax compliance and a nice analogy that that rohit gave it's a right of passage going from teens to adulthood but if you've not got your value system right you will find you'll find the challenges coming about as you step into adulthood you know a number of startups they don't say earmark resources to invest in a designated cfo or a tax team to take care of compliance now if you take a startup through a cycle priyanka typical growth cycle from say c series a to b c seed funding to ipo the broad set of compliance needs they scale very differently as opposed to established enterprises where there are established processes and the business model doesn't change so the finance team i guess has to be a lot more agile so i want to know from you as a as a cfo how do cfos of startups become an enabler of change in the business model say from an inventory model to a marketplace model if i had to take an example while still being compliant how do you think startups can begin to address this industry wide problem uh gotham there are many and more tools now available to uh, be compliant uh, you know while there are the established ones like the oracles and the sap that that offer specific modules to ensure that your compliance is right and accurate etc but for startups these may not be cost efficient so you can use other tech solutions which make the tax compliances easy economical whether it is tds returns gst returns income tax filings etc like uh, you know rohit uh, pansari took the example of clear tax which helps filing the gst return on a click of a button similarly uh, tally gold it gives it produces the json file uh, for the easy upload of uh, gst uh, if your you know database is correctly updated uh, there are many more similar examples uh, gst bitra is one compute tax is there uh, taxman uh, taxman is there there are these wa- various viable options for tds tcs returns etc most of these also have an uh, you know excel import function which is available which makes it convenient to upload on the government uh, website and which is very cost uh, efficient as well however there are other limitations uh, if there is a wrong input of of a data like a pan number etc that it will have to be manually inputted uh, when you receive notices from the government and as um, you know rohit rajan said that government is is collecting a lot of more data connecting the dots and obviously they are asking a lot more questions Uh, when they send you notices etc the response has to be manually made the data has to be manually collated in response to the question etc but overall a lot of these products they do sort out the uh, the bau life uh, releasing a lot of capacity uh, for other uh, you know activities um, also government is changing these laws very frequently there are updates happening every now and then uh, there are tax laws you know etc which are changing quite often 
so in my opinion startups should definitely use and uh, be connected with some good consultants um, you know for their initial structures for what has changed uh, what new needs to be done etc because the amount of interest and penalties that get levied by the government for non compliances is huge and may hit the uh, startups so overall there is a there is a good now developed ecosystem to help startups ensure that they are compliant with, with various government laws and regulations so as your role as a cfo has technology made your days easier or tougher considering there's so much compliance to follow so much easier from from the days that we started so much easier you you should have a structured database and everything then gets uh, done on a click of a button really all right let's hear the coo's perspective lavanya your thoughts on how do say coos of a startup become enabler of change considering business models of a startup they change from they could change from an inventory model to a marketplace just like that so how do you remain compliant how do you how do you become an enabler of compliance yeah um so gautam i think so one thing what what we really have to talk about is that uh, we cannot restrict tax and compliance only to the finance function okay uh, this is this is one of the very important so before being becoming a ceo i was obviously a cfo so i understand both the aspects of the business um but it is very important that you enable tax and compliance as a culture in the company you know so you know you have to uh, you have to uh, kind of give the impression to the organization that you want to be at the right side when it comes to tax and compliance you know a lot of times what we see is that uh, in you know just enabling so you know how if we can do sessions like you know tax for non non finance people and all that and also people who are in commercial front are um, understand the tax saying that ye ye gst pe input credit milega nahi milega so that they kind of take care that in pricing you know so like lot of times you say capex there is not like full you don't get benefit or there are certain things where you can't take benefit of gst so how do you kind of make them aware so that they make the correct commercial decision is very very important you cannot come and say that are tax pay kiya to you know i lost the margin what i was making on that so it is very important because tax in certain deals is a make or break you know you make money or don't make money if you don't do your tax structure especially the current rates what you are talking about at 12% 18% gst you know those are like equivalent to kind of you know uh, do the margin so i would say it's very important for startup ecosystem to be really clear about tax and how we can educate all the people at least the people in commercial functions and certain things will really help to kind of um, you know enable this so i feel uh, it has to get ingrained there has to be investments uh, uh, in in terms of compliance yes compliance is after you do the transaction and especially in a startup ecosystem uh, what you see is the change is changes change happens much faster people want to do um, while you spoke only about inventory to marketplace but there are a lot of other things also which you kind of do sourcing outsourcing you know looking at new models there are some things which uh, the government does not even has found out today as part of a revenue model and then you kind of need to understand what are the taxation implications which kind of comes out to you so i feel uh, having a very uh, informed organization on tax and compliance is obviously going to be the key for organizations in future to grow today like cfo is not restricted only to finance i think so the orgs is also not restricted you know say that ye tax uh, the finance organization will kind of take it they will take mm -hmm. positions they will go and uh, do the representations do the filings but you know they need to be completely aware about what what it means for us such So that's true the silos are breaking down where roles of cfos ctos cios coos it's all coming together and everyone needs to drive value for the organization and i take your point lavanya that the organization they itself needs to be informed all all cogs of the organization need to be aware on compliance but the issue comes when it when the organization interacts with the broader ecosystem right if suppliers vendors merchants and the issue is you know we uh, there are say a, a, a certain amount of uh, msmes which are registered but this is a conversation point which came up earlier that we have crores of msmes but if you look at the 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 registration part of it not many have done that uh, because they fear of the compliance radar of coming under a compliance radar because 
because they worry that the burden of compliance will swarm them so much that they might not be able to grow. Any points on addressing that in your opinion, Lavanya? So, so I think so. MSME, um, I would say that there is more benefit for you to register in as part of MSME. And this is something which we have like really spoken to see. One of the things is government is really promoting schemes for MSME. Okay. If hmm. not simple working capital, you can solve because everybody has to pay the MSME within the 30 days or the 45 days, you know. So this is a big and then the reporting requirements for MSME for a larger organization saying Mera MSME mein itna overdue hai, which nobody wants to kind of report on their financial statements, the filings, what you do half yearly. I think so getting registered and now the government is relaxed actually. Uh, during COVID, when they relaxed the guidelines, I at least saw with my vendors that many more people went and registered themselves as MSME and gave me the certificate. So I, I don't know. People are not like worried about compliance. They know, but the benefit what they get out of registering out of MSME seems to be much larger than the tax compliance, what they do, you know. And there are products which are available and people are willing to take that additional effort. But I do see adoption of MSME increasing at least during this COVID period, you know. So I don't say it it, 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 it as a very discouraging at this point of time. All yes, right, there are a... issues. Yeah. Sure, sure. Go there ahead. Issues, Go ahead love. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. There are issues, but I feel they feel the benefit uh, what they get of MSME registration seems to be far more. All right, that's a differing viewpoint. Interesting to see that the industry also sees encouraging signs on registration happening when it comes to compliance from their small vendors. Another aspect uh, for any discussion on this ESOPs, and I'm sure this will this will you know make uh, ears go up in terms of interest of our viewing audience. And I'll come to you for that, Abhishek. Employee stock options, key attraction for talent to join startups. And it's been raining ESOPs in 2021 with around 32 Indian startups spending close to $440 million to buy back ESOPs. Now, the government had implemented certain changes in the taxation of ESOPs to make it friendlier for the employees. Do you think these measures have helped? And is there any further opportunity there for ESOPs to be more tax friendly for employees? Because at present, startup employees who opt for ESOPs, they're required to pay taxes twice, right? First, when they sign up for the ESOPs and then again when they redeem their shares. Now, this creates a sort of a cash flow challenge for employees given that there are no ready markets for, say, selling the shares of startups, unlike, say, listed companies. Now, even though the five-year tax holiday on ESOPs, it's seen as a positive step, dual taxation remains a major concern area. Moreover, you know, only the startups recognized by the IMB, the Interministerial Board, are eligible to be av to avail this benefit. With no more than, I believe, 250 IMB startups being there. So, the majority will remain unaffected by this new new tax regime. So broadly, where do things stand with regards to ESOPs and more, what more can be done from a tax perspective to make it more attractive for folks who works in startups? Yeah, no, I think Gautam, that's a, that's a very important point. And uh, one of the reason why um, the we get top quality talent in uh, startups is the opportunity of creating non-linear uh, wealth, right? Uh, which only comes with the uh, and not just wealth creation, but it's also uh, 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 objective alignment and uh, um, aligning the teams uh, to the broader goals of the company. So it's the most important tool for uh, attracting and retaining talent, right? Um, the Like you said, the, the fundamental issue is that um, the uh, stocks or ESOPs are taxable uh, at the point when they are exercised. Uh, in the form of a perquisite income, which are paid at the highest marginal uh, rate of tax, which is uh, what is applicable to your salary income. And then at that point of time, there may not be a liquidity event. So it becomes a dry tax cost and a cash flow issue for, for the employees. And then, um, uh, although there is no double taxation, because then they ultimately, when they are sold, uh, then they have to pay capital gain tax on the difference between the exercise price and the ultimate sale price. The issue is about timing, right? And like you rightly said, the government has uh, taken a positive step in that direction with, uh, with uh, you know, eligible startups being uh, uh, given some benefits. But, but the reality is that there are about 28,000 um, startups which are registered uh, with the, you know, Department of Promotion and Industrial Internal Trade, DPIIT. But like you said, only 250 of them are actually eligible uh, to take the benefit of these relaxations. So we've actually recommended uh, in our pre-budget rec OYO's uh, recommendations that uh, we extend the benefit of um, this ESOP taxation to all startups who are registered with uh, uh, DPIT. That will enable uh, the deferment of tax uh, to completion of five years from when they're exercised or when they are sold, 
right? Uh, so, so that at least gives some some window for people to either find liquidity events to uh, you know pay their taxes, and then the other other element is that if in case um, the employee leaves the organization and there there is no liquidity event, even the current uh, you know the change law also still requires you to pay the taxes uh, even if you're an eligible startup. So, so two things: first, that the eligible startup definition should be expanded where more and more uh, of the uh, companies or startups can can really benefit from it uh, because uh, uh, right now only a handful of benefit and then benefiting and then uh, uh, relaxing them further that the condition of leaving the company and paying having to pay taxes on it even for the eligible taxes uh, startups that probably needs to be relooked at and uh, still peg it to the the sale event uh, or extending the time further because uh, uh, um, think of an individual employee uh, to finance this tax, they have to avail um, loans, which are difficult to come by, or the companies have to um, fund these loans. In either way, this is not an optimum scenario because then, then you are pledging your shares and all of that. Uh, many of the employees, as individual, um, you know, taxpayers, uh, are already uh, grappling with multiple home loans, car loans, etc. So the last thing that we want to riddle them with is a uh, ESOP tax loan, uh, and and therefore. I think uh, the government is open to this and uh, steps have been made in the right direction. Uh, but I think now is the time to open them up further and expand to a larger base. Well, looking forward to budget 2022. Let's see if government accepts the advice of industry and takes care of all those measures. Well, as we head to the last leg of the discussion, the keyword advice, let me take that forward. Rohit Pansari, what advice do you have for startups that are currently in the scaling up phase? What should tax compliance or rather why should tax compliance be an integral part of their strategy yeah so tax compliances as i said earlier also tax compliances uh, should be an integral part because uh, even if you are going for any ipo or any strategic buyout any of your foreign investors coming in I have been part of many diligence in my career and I have felt that and understood that any any company who is fully compliant, not only tax, other compliances as well, the uh, the interest of the offshore companies to invest is much higher as compared if it's non-compliant. Have, we have seen deals falling through if the uh, company is not compliant. So, and, and it's the most important thing is it's not only... Uh, when you are in the scaling of uh, phase in the young entrepreneurs of today, so uh, they want to focus on their niche, on their core competency, right? Rather than getting stuck in any of the tax cases with due to some negligence, you're not able to, uh, uh, it was not done on time or things like that. So in that scenario, you spend time on something which was not, not of their core competency and it drags the business at the back front. At times we have seen people uh, losing their GST numbers. Plus, it's a great loss of reputation for the firms in case of uh, some, some uh, e-invoicing issues, which you're not following. It, for the operations team, it might look a very, very minuscule thing. But if the case is open, then it's, a, it's your, uh, your GST portal is banned and you are not able to generate invoices. So that, that hampers your business at that point of time. You're not able to uh, run the business for, say, two days or three days. That, that's, a, that's a bottleneck. That becomes a bottleneck. So... Yeah, and, and second, uh, the kind of interest and the penalties at times it is levied. It is very important for the companies to follow the tax regime, tax regulations, because especially the Indian government is, uh, is leaving no stone unturned to leave any gap for any kind of uh, fraud or tax evasion things to happen in, in, in future, right? So uh, for, for entrepreneurs, it's very important uh, if they want to scale it and take the business to the next level, tax ke to tax to dena padega and bina tax ke kaam hoga nahi. So that has to be done. <laughs> As they say, there are two things certain in life, death and taxes. Yeah. But a, a very interesting point that you mentioned, Rohit Pansari, which is that, you know, compliance is seen as a value driver, especially for international investors looking to invest in Indian startups since they see that as a strategic market. So they're pumping capital into startups. So to get the last word on this, Rohit Razdan, as your namesake said, how can technology help startups meet compliances both at the pre-funding 
and the post funding stages to help keep up with these massive inflows of FDIs and IPO boom since as I mentioned India is a strategic market and compliance is now being seen as a value driver for startups for international investors looking to invest into them so your last word on this sure I would actually just uh, uh, just double click and highlight uh, something very important that uh, Rohit Pansari just mentioned right and actually there is an IFC study which is exactly uh, you know which hits the same point there was a study that IFC did across like I, I don't know some like you know 600 or 800 odd investors global investors and and they they mentioned that 100 percent of those investors right uh, would pay up to 28 percent or something higher uh, for a company with a better governance right uh, so so this has now become a very very important thing and 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 call it whether a, a developing market uh, you know, uh, goes that we have to carry on our backs or whatever, right? When when an external investor looks at India, right? They in general or or in outside of you know a few I would say Anglo-Saxon countries, right? They assume everything is dirty, right? And and I would say statistically they would be right, right? Statistically they would be. Right. Uh, so they are constantly looking for ways to see whether whether the company is is clean and smells good, right? So the you know, so I think, and they also realize, so they give, you know, some, some bit of, I would say, leeway to series A kind of companies by series B and so on. It, it starts to become like less tolerable, but series B or C onwards, right? They, they know what, what smells good and what doesn't smell good, right? The, the companies themselves know, and, and they go searching that very, very quickly. So that the reason why uh, Indian startups actually get, get valued and, and the good Indian startups or the, or the winning startups, as you may call it. Uh, get valued at a very high level is because the demand side is actually very clear in India, right? Like if you play any game in India for like 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, right? And that's how some of the foreign investors look at it, right? That, okay, I will play one third or one half of a 15 year battle, right? And then somebody else will and so on. So the demand side is very clear in almost anything, right? We have like still cement growing in the company at, you know, in the country at 15, 17%, right? So I think, I think the if cement is growing, everything else will grow, right? Uh, so where they, they differentiate is like, are the companies, uh, you know, kind of long-term oriented, right? And what generally people know just is that if you have good governance, right, you generally have, you know, a good, good way of, you know, navigating a 15 year kind of a time period. So I think, I think that is very, very important that Rohit mentioned and, and, and towards that, you know, people look at compliance now as, as the, one of the key differentiators. And now see the other thing I'll mention is, it's become very easy to determine compliance five years, seven years back used to be a commodity in the sense that everybody used to be at the same level, right? Today, that's not the case, right? There's some people who are very, very good in compliance and they can demonstrate it, right? Mm. It's demonstrable by GST records, by this record, that record, and so on and so forth, right? There are other companies which have poor compliance, which is also demonstrable by the same records, right? So now when an investor gets into a company or is looking at a company, and he says that, well, this company, this best in class company showed me these 16 certificates that they had. Can you show me your 16 certificates? And you'll either say, I don't have it, right? Or you'll say, I'll, I'll, I'll take time and so on. And then the guys can smell it, right? Hmm. So I think now, you're, you know, it's become, com uh, compliance is not a commodity anymore. And by the way, we see it like, you know, so we have two sets of customers, right? One set of customers who are forward looking, one set of customers who are pain, right? Uh, who, who are not forward looking for whom, you know, this is this. Uh, you know, is a is a is a is a no other choice left, right? And only then they would adopt a technological tool, right? So we see this uh, that they have also seen the, the the reality. Now, I think what we try to do is uh, we we give you on on one platform, right? All all the tools that that you require from a compliance standpoint, and we have our stack is also honestly deepening as the government stack is deepening, right? Like there are, and by the way, like let me also make this point. What you see today in taxes, right, is going to be everywhere, right? So, so that approach that the government is taking will be on ROC filings, right? They will become very, very API, API file, digitized. Uh, there will be things, uh, uh, you know, a labor law, right? I think that that will come, right? And you'll have to do all these kind of submissions and so on, uh, you know, again, digitally, right? 100% digital. So I think this is coming and and what I think what we want to do and what we aspire to do as a company is that once you connect our pipe into your company, right, then you, you know, 80 to 90 percent of, of your pain is gone, right, of, of whatever is enabled from the data that you have. Then as Priyanka said, where the battle goes is 
have you put in enough clean data in your company itself? If you're not capturing data cleanly, and that both Priyanka and Lavanya kind of alluded to, that has to become their mindset. What does what mindset does the company has, right? Once that mindset is covered, then you will have all the dashboards. You know, you once a CFO knows, right, that my books are 100% clean, my compliance is 100% clean, right? There is a certain strut in the walk, right? There is a certain confidence in their talk when they sit in front of, you know, a DD agency, right? Whatever you want to see, you can see, right? Um, and again, right, I'm saying this as uh, both somebody has been on as an investing side and, and on, the, on the operating side. Uh, it's tough to get there, right? But once mm -hmm. you get this very, very scalable, right? Then you can see series B to C to D, Jo Atai Ajay, right? I am I have everything, you know, uh, ready. Right. So I think I think that's where I think uh, you know uh, the right tools can play or the right right uh, third party uh, instruments, tools, services or whatever can 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 take a you know ro role in uh, making things easier. Absolutely. Some great points there. As you mentioned, Rohit, compliance is not a commodity. It's almost like a way of life because at the end of the day, the data pipe in your company, if that is tainted, unfortunately, nothing can be done. But if you make sure that systems and processes are in place to make sure you have a proper data pipe coming in, which eases your compliance burden as, say, things get more, more value added and more into the system. We have providers like Clear helping companies out on that. Then you have the bandwidth to go and really grow because then you don't have to worry on the compliance aspect of it. Uh, Lavanya, your, your response to the point that uh, points that uh, Rohit has raised, uh, we'll get your viewpoint before we close the discussion. Yeah, so one thing uh, I just want to add both to Rohit, you know, both the Rohit uh, actually uh, saying that, I think so one of the things what investors really look at is their brand image, you know, the brand image of the company, okay? Uh, so they also want to be associated with companies who are compliant, right? It, it, so they are investing in a portfolio. So they, it, it also represents um, the brand, you know, so if, if they have invest the companies which have, um, you know, which are not compliant, it also reflects that. So usually you would see as soon as uh, an investor comes in after a series B, series C, usually they will start tightening up the, you know, the finance aspect of it, right? And also one thing which we need to keep in mind is most of these people will have directors on the board of these companies, you know, the cost of non-compliance for all of them is obviously quite huge. So uh, we always see that people, you know, they insist on compliance because the cost of non-compliance on the brand image of the company, I, I'm not even talking financial, financial is one thing, but it also impacts your, uh, you know, ability to do business, you know, and people, how they associated with it. So I don't think so. Nobody in the, whether it's the investor, the company, the promoter, nobody wants to compromise that position. And hence the debate of whether tax and compliance is important is like, is actually futile in a long, in a, in a, in a, in a long way, actually, if you ask me. Absolutely. It all boils down to trust. Trust yeah. is invaluable in that entire ecosystem. And of course, compliance helps you become trustworthy both to your internal partners and to external investors. On that note, it's time to bring an end to this discussion where we've learned how startups can negotiate this minefield of GST and tax compliances while continuing on their growth trajectory. I'd like to thank all the panelists for sharing with us their insights on the topic. And of course, thank you to our audience for tuning in as well. Do remember to fill out that survey form and submit it to us before you leave. And finally, thanks to Clear as well for partnering with us for today's session. Till next time, this is Gautam Srinivasan signing off. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.